back to our last panel of the day, which is going to deal again with the theme of uh, consumer protection, the customers of the future. And we have a, a very good panel, as you can see, very international panel also. Uh, we're going to discuss this. And to my left-hand side, the first person is Ida Luca, and she told me to pronounce her name as Lognone, although she is Polish-French. Uh, Ida Luca Lognone, you find all the details uh, in the uh, bio, but she is CEO International Health of Allianz Worldwide Partners in France. Then we have, uh, next to uh, Ida, we have Yoshi Kawai. Yoshi Kawai does not need to be presented, but I do it nevertheless. He is, of course, Secretary General of the IAIS. Next uh, to uh, Yoshi, we have uh, Julie Mix McPeak from the NEIC. She is the uh, uh, Vice President of the NEIC and, of course, Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. Next to her, we have Mario Vella. Mario Vella is the Chairman of the Association of Mexican Insurance Companies. Very welcome. And last but not least, we have Gordon Watson, who is the CEO of GNP Seguros, also in Mexico is regional chief executive. Uh, sorry, sorry, I got that mixed up. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to have two Mexicans on my. That would be too dangerous. <laughs> so no, Gordon, Gordon, who is of course regional chief executive of AIA Group in Hong Kong. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. let's start with a last panel. I apologize, Gordon, but now I see that everybody is awake after lunch. Um, Ida. I want to talk to you first and ask you the questions. Uh, we look at the futures. How are the risks changing? What emerging risks will the customers of tomorrow need? Can you clarify or thinking about that? Well, first of all, so I hope that now everybody's really awoke after all the things which you said, <laughs> wrongly or, or rightly. Uh, I think in terms of risks which the consumer is facing, we, I think over the whole day we already tackled many of these risks and uh, there will be not much of, uh, I would say, of new insights which can be brought. But uh, just to put them into the perspective, I think we have the whole changing world and the biggest part of it is the technology. And we spoke the whole day about technology and in terms of opportunities and risks which this is bringing to our industry and in general. And I think I will elaborate just a, a little bit around that because this part of the, let's say, emerging risks are having, I think, most of all, most of the opportunities for us. Uh, however, we'll have to tackle this from the point of view which was already mentioned over the day, which is how do we deal with the data which are coming through the technology which is uh, increasingly giving us this opportunity. Uh, I think as well that the second part, and this was also brought it's all about the climate, let's say, we talk change, but risks, and it was properly said that we talk more about the risks. So the whole area of climate risks uh, is something which is increasingly important because we talk about really high peak risks and it's different from what we have probably seen um, till now. There is another area which is uh, which was always there, but it's probably even increasing. It's the whole area of what I call risks around a person. And we talked about demographics. So how uh, the aging population is creating, I would say, additional risk which the society is facing. And then what does it mean in terms of our industry and how we are going to tackle this? And I think the last panel again uh, talked about it. But people risks is not only about the aging population. It's also about all different type of I would say, issues which a person will have with other parts of the risks which we mentioned. The, most of the time we talk about uh, technology in terms of cyber risks for companies. We say it's about uh, business interruption, for example. We say it's reputation. But there are a lot of risks for individual person related to the technological risks. And we'll talk about it as well. So for me, we have to take a person in its let's say, totality and take all these different type of risks emerging and say, what do we do with that? 
And then I think there is also the risks which have been there, but it's increasing, it's all the geopolitical risks. And again, why it's even more important and it's creating additional risks which we have to protect, or let's say let's try to protect, is because we have mobility which is much more higher than we ever had. If you look at the population today in terms of uh, not the immigration which always existed, but the uh, corporate world, for example, and then we as employers who are supposed to protect our employees, the mobility was never as high as today, and then geopolitical risks are even more important. So I would say these are majority of the new emerging risks which we will have to, and we already do, uh, tackle and uh, provide, um, provide response. We already have a lot, and I know that we will talk about it. Uh, for me, the most important part is not only to find the response in terms of opportunity, how we will protect, and we know that insurance is very much about financial protection. When we say protection, is very much about providing financial protection. But I think what will change and it, what should change is that we have to think how we give the solution to these risks and services. And I think some of the panelists already talked about it. I'm very passionate about the fact that we have to think differently, not only protecting customer from the financial point of view, but how do we service that we take the problem out of his uh, life. That's the most important thing. It's not about insurance, it's about making sure that the problem they are facing is solved. So that's my first I introduction. I think that's beautiful. I want to come back to that, but I first want to get to uh, Yoshi. Yeah. You're on this panel, and of course you ask yourself the question uh, why I am on this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, you're on this panel because we, we were w wondering What's the contribution of the IES to this debate? Is the IES thinking about the customer of the future? Uh, and how are you doing that? Because the world is so divergent. Yeah. Is it possible for the IES to say anything sensible on mm -hmm. that topic? Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Just before answering, answering your question, as uh, a head of international association, I travel a lot, but I confess, uh, I travel around the world, but I confess that this is the first time that I came to Ireland. And I just thank the Irish colleague and also Sergio and Michael, excellent organization, particularly after having heard this uh, Dirk's uh, comment that uh, Guinness is good for our health. <laughs> and promised to drink <laughs> strong motivation but to drink Guinness. Remember, <laughs> just one pint. <laughs> yeah, okay. So hopefully I keep that, you know, one pint. But, uh, Globalization, just to make it clear, this uh, digital uh, you know, industry and this uh, uh, new technology development is, as you said this afternoon, one click. One click or four clicks or any click. We don't know this click arrived to anywhere around the world. You know? Like when we call uh, that uh, telephone service, we don't know the person, the other line of the call is where it is. So this digital economy or this technology development create huge, huge importance of global approach. And that's, that's very much obvious, that global approach. Uh, and once something happens, we need a global cooperation, coordination is needed. And as IOPA, Gabriel's organization provides solution in Europe, and NAIC, Julie or John's, or John's association provide American solution. But this digital world, we need a global solution where I uh, step in and we play an extremely important role. And by the way, the mission of us, our association is not, and people just misunderstand that the IS does capital, IS does systemic risk approach and so on. Of course, that's an important activity, but bottom line, mission statement of association is promote effective and global consistent supervision for the interest and the protection of policyholders. So policyholders' protection in a global scale is our mission, and we do work on this issue. And specifically, the new technology issue, cyber issue, fintech, we have a very much interest, and we provide a platform, platform of insurance regulators around the world sit together, we exchange views, and particularly like cyber issue, fintech issue, 
we create our work stream, our creating a work stream and exchange views, learn each other best practice like Julie's or you know Americans do and other part of the world do, and we we create, we learn each other and try to find the best practice, which eventually could lead to supervisory best practice, i.e. standard. So that's what we do. And as for specifically uh, cyber risk and fintech issue, cyber risk, as, as we discussed, this is a huge opportunity for the industry, not only providing a product, but as you said, solution. Solution as a package. And from the supervisory point of view, what is needed now is raising awareness. Raising awareness, of course, it's the industry's important role, but it's a huge gap, the need of the product, but awareness of this product. So that's an important element, and more specifically for the protection of cyber risk to the insurance company, I think that what is needed is we have to have a clear, very much operational risk management with the company. I just want to point it out a little bit later, not now. And for the fintech side, we just learn from industry's practice, and not only in the IAS, but in collaboration with our banking regulator, and the payment regulator and security regulator together and to develop some know-how or take stock of what the industry's practice is. And again, we just examine carefully. Of course, there's a huge pot potential positive impact, but it could have a negative impact, huge impact to the policy holders. So we have to examine carefully to that aspect too. So just, I stop here, but I look forward yeah. to have a more. Sure, sorry, I, I will come back to you, but I want to, to, to turn now to Julie, uh, the U.S. is still the most important insurance market in the world, still. Huh? Maybe China will become one day. But uh, can you share with us some of the developments in the U.S.? Uh, uh, we heard about the clicks. These clicks usually come from the U.S. Is, is Google going to be the biggest insurer tomorrow in the U.S.? Well, not in initially tomorrow, but maybe not so far off in the future. They're certainly interested in insurance and combining the uh, rating factors to provide a true real-time comparison of prices and policies uh, for consumers. And so that data is not something that is immediately available in, in our market today, but that's certainly where they, they tend to be going. I, I will tell you that one of our primary areas of focus in the United States um, is really on what we would uh, consider to be a crisis in retirement security planning. And uh, we feel like customers and consumers need to have uh, more information, more education on planning for their own secure retirement. And, and to that, you know, life insurers offering retirement security products are facing challenges from a lot of different factors. And consumers are purchasing products that um, they may not understand or may not be appropriate for their needs and that we need to make sure that these products are being offered at a value to consumers themselves. Um, add to that the outside pressures of low interest rates and um, they're impacting retirement savings as well as the life insurance industry, uh, even making it more difficult to plan to save for retirement. And um, you know, while that is not a solvency issue for carriers at this point, it does create such a drag on earnings and it compresses the spread for anybody in this business, such as annuity providers. So the NEIC, in response, really launched a new retirement security initiative focusing on three major themes for this year. Uh, the first being education, secondly, consumer protection, and finally, product innovation. And we're going to really focus consumer education uh, with a campaign designed to encourage consumers of, of all ages to adequately plan for their retirement years and have a better understanding of more and more inherently complex products. And this includes a focus on um, educating seniors about products and um, some of the issues of elder abuse and exploitation. Uh, we do intend to um, emphasize and um, our suitability requirements to make sure that unfair marketing and brokers are understanding the products that they are selling to uh, consumers of all ages. And on consumer protection, you know, we do continue to have an important role to review the current laws and regulations at the NAIC to make sure that we are adapting to the new technologies, the new ways of marketing, the new products that are being offered in this space and in, in all lines of insurance. And finally, on product innovation, we need to identify areas where we have stifled innovation and in product design. 
um, you know, any laws or regulations that are antiquated that don't recognize the use of electronic signatures, for instance. Uh, we also need to understand how big data is being used by insurers and make sure that that technology is being used to benefit consumers and not just used uh, to negatively, negatively impact those. Um, innovation can also really be focused on how products can, can be less complex and more transparent while still meeting a consumer's financial needs for the future. Uh, finally, we're looking at long-term care insurance because that is a huge issue in the United States and the role that the private market can play in financing the long-term care needs of our society. We do have a new subgroup to look at innovative ways to address the challenges of this market and develop realistic policy options and uh, product, uh, products that will serve this market. We do look forward to working with consumer and industry groups to help us identify new products or redesign current products to meet the needs of, of all of our consumers. Very interesting uh, and good lead-in to, to Mario. Mm -hmm. um, is there still an interest in, in Mexico in, in live products? And is this still a, a product that you can sell? Uh, in Europe, for instance, we've heard one of the largest, maybe the largest insurer in the world saying that he's moving out of traditional life products. Uh, is this still a market in, uh, in Mexico? And how do you see things evolving going forward? I think that's, a, that's an easy answer. And it's, a, it's an easy answer also for that company that you just mentioned. I think that everybody wants guarantees. Everybody. When you got here to this hotel, everybody expected the room to be guaranteed. When you buy a car, you expect a guarantee. When you buy a new house, you expect a guarantee. When you have a service, you expect a guarantee. It's, it's, it's our nature. We, we expect guarantees in everything. So corporate, corporate bonds are sold, uh, government bonds are sold because there is a need for guarantees, be it from a corporation or be it for an individual. I mean, every day, there, every year, there is 4.2 billion transactions and bonds, bond transactions, 4.2 billion. So there's a huge interest in the market for guarantees, no matter what guarantee we're talking about. And for life insurance, there is a huge need for guarantees. Why somebody would leave a, such an environment is an easy answer. It's the environment is causing a lot of us to question if we continue, if we want to continue to be in the guarantee business. The low interest rate is compressing our returns, and so we're questioning if we should continue to be or not in that environment. Regulation is not helping. The changes that most of us are undergoing here in regulation are requiring that we uh, put more capital every time that we see, sell a, a life policy. And so what we're guaranteeing is that through this methodology, uh, we're basically kicking everybody out of the live long-term uh, policy business because you require higher capital with lower interest, higher regulatory cost because we're now required to do other things that we were not required to do in the past. And, uh, and so our shareholders now have a huge interest to move everybody out of guarantees. But it's not, the, it's not that there is not a need. It's not that the market doesn't want guarantees. The market loves guarantees. We seem to not like from a regulation perspective, guarantees. And that's what's driving people out. I mean, we talk about what the customer wants. We're not listening to the customer. Very We're doing interesting, very interesting. One second. Yes. <laughs> let, me, let me ask the, the panel, how, isn't there a responsibility for all of us, regulators, insurance companies, associations, to create a, a, a virtuous cycle <clears throat> for people to retire with dignity, where we provide long-term investment opportunities uh, for people to retire or for their kids to go to school, we're running away from that. And we should find ways to do so, not to run out of there as quickly as we can. And it's the responsibility from everybody here. It's not just the regulator. It's not just the insurance companies. It's not the associations. It's everybody. We need to figure out a way of running out of this vicious cycle and converting it into a virtuous cycle. And I think it's time that we question if the, I think everybody agrees that Solvency is here, Solvency 2 is here to stay, and I, I'm not planning or uh, pushing anybody to question Solvency 2, but I think we need to adjust the model. The model is gonna kill the long-term life uh, business, regretfully. Very interesting, I will come back to, to, to that, of course, uh, afterwards. But first of all, uh, I want to listen to Gordon, who 
again, he's not from Mexico, he's uh, <laughs> based in, in Hong Kong. And I want to, you know, we, we wanted you on this panel because Asia has probably different traditions and what we want to hear from you is how do you see the interaction between an insurer and the customer? Uh, how can you yeah. improve customer engagement? How does it operate in Asia? Can you tell us okay, something yeah, about yeah. your experience there? Sure, thanks Carl. Um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm definitely not from Mexico. Um, <laughs> but you may not guess that I am based in Hong Kong. And you know, talking about the Asian market, uh, you know, it's not one Asia, but Asia, the GDP growth rates, um, you know, a lot higher than Europe, with the exception I heard this morning of Ireland, which, uh, well done guys, very impressed, great recovery. Um, but I think the thing about Asia that's really different is there's no real social security safety net. So the need for private insurance is really amplified. It really is amplified because there's not that safety net anywhere or, or most places in Asia. The, the protection gap's about 57 uh, trillion US dollars, um, which is massive. The penetration rate, single, low single digits. So for us, the biggest challenge really is the reach and how to reach people, um, how to tell them what their own protection gap is. Because they don't understand they want this. We need to show them that they actually need this. Because if we left, you know, and just asked what the customer wants, we'd end up selling mutual funds, and, and we don't sell mutual funds. So it's very important that we have the best point of sale technology to really visually show each person one by one what their own personal protection gap is. Now, now you asked about engagement, and engagement is very difficult in life insurance because um, most people only die once. So, are you sure? I, well, I are did say sure? that in India, and I get into trouble. Um, <laughs> but most people only die once, so when you only die once in your life insurance company, it's very difficult to have you know, interaction with them, and, and we really wanted to be easy to do business, and every time we had a pause, an interaction, it, you know, it was good for the brand, etc. cetera. Um, insurance companies, we all know, have uh, you know, the lowest of net promoter scores. I mean, no one's really spoken about that, customer advocates and how to measure it, but we really do. I mean, we're even worse than banks. I mean, I think the only... Cable companies in the, the US are the only ones that are lower than insurance companies. Um, so we really want to be easy to do business with. And we thought, how can we really engage? And we looked around the world and we looked at different things. And we thought, you know, with you know, chronic disease, you know, there are three behaviors now, you know, diet, exercise, you know, there's diet, the, there's exercise, you know, and, and, and if you smoke, they cause four diseases, you know, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and cancers. And, and that causes 50%, more than 50% of deaths in the world today, and that's only going to increase. So we thought if we could somehow start the conversation with our clients, you know, it's almost like a shared value because, you know, if they get well, then, you know, better mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the one thing is, you know, in behavioral economics 101, um, Everyone wants instant gratification. So how could we do that? Because people don't want to do the hard yards of going to the gym and exercising, you know, and if they get sick, they take an Advil. So we need to change, how do you go from, you know, treatment to prevention? And that's very difficult. So, you know, keeping it very simple, we, uh, we decided, you know, we would give them rewards if they exercised. So we now set challenges every week. You know, I went to the gym instead of having lunch today because I meet my challenge. And you know, you get a free health drink every week. So we, we really wanted to, people to, first of all, get to know their own health. And, and we did that by, uh, you know, you have a biological age and you have your vitality age. Um, you know, most people's vitality age is about four years higher than their, their biological age. And once you see that, you get a bit of a shock so once you get that shock, then we put together a plan for you um, so that, you know, whether you go to the gym or whatever, and then we give you discounts, etc. And then we give you the rewards, whether they're instant, they can be big rewards, whatever. And that's how we thought we could engage uh, in their everyday lives. So, for example, you know, if you go to the supermarket and you spend, you know, a thousand Hong Kong dollars, um, 
we will give you a discount on health food. So if you spend, you know, 400 of that $1,000 on health food, we give you a 20% discount and then, or a 15, depending on what it is. And then at the end, you reinforce your brand. So, so we have that constant engagement in people's lives, which is, which is really very different. And we monitored the products that took the wellness program versus those that didn't. And, uh, you know, in the, in the first couple of years, the number of interactions increased by over 15 times. So that's what we're trying to do in Asia, you know, all over, most places in Asia to try and foster that, you know, brand loyalty, increase their net promoter score, um, and hopefully have engaged customers. And that, does it work? Do you see that people appreciate what you're doing? Uh, or did they say, uh, don't bother me? I mean, I want to have my three pints of Guinness instead of just one, and we'll I'll die whenever I should, die. Now, now that I know Guinness is healthy, we should definitely give a 20% discount in, in Guinness. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, you, you ha first of all, we have to make sure the system works. So when we did it at first, we had a, a couple of glitches, um, you know, and that just gets, it's that, instead of a positive interaction, it's a negative interaction. But once you start to get into your cadence, um, it really does work in people, because people don't talk about life insurance around the barbecue, but they do talk about, you know, health and wellness, and it's, it's kind of, you know, I was in California recently and they have, you know, they have wine, they have love and they have wellness, you know, it's, it's kind of a trendy word. So insurance company is quite difficult to enter into that space. Okay, Julie, from uh, your point about long-term care in the US, how does this sound, this, this message? Is that some, some of the way forward that uh, you also get insurers to, to, to be involved in, in elderly homes and uh, hospitals and things like that? Uh, well, I love the idea of diet and exercise and, and fitness, but it was certainly in the United States, we would be looking very closely at how you collect the data about the visits to the health club, about the uh, grocery dollars that you spend, and whether you're spending um, your voucher for healthcare foods, because how you collect that data, and particularly when it works positively for the customer, that's a good thing. When it is used against a customer for higher ratings, that's not such a good thing in our viewpoint uh, from the regulatory perspective. And so you have to be very, very careful. We would love to encourage wellness and, and healthy behaviors because I do think that it would impact um, not only life insurance products but that long-term care because, you know, the most costly, anyone who has long-term care coverage generally is going to use it at some point in their life because you're going to need need some form of assistance at some point. And getting the products that we have on the market today to be pr priced appropriately for that risk, it's very, very challenging. And that's why we're looking at um, new and innovative products. Could we have a life product with an assisted living benefit with some wellness factors on it? I think that would have a lot of attractiveness to a certain market. Would it apply broadly to all United States consumers? You know, probably not. Those that would rather not exercise on a regular basis, you know, would not access that benefit, but it would create an option for those that were interested in pursuing a lifestyle of that nature. Okay. Uh, Mario, uh on, on your, you made a strong plea for guarantees, you said people want guarantees. Um, I think in some parts of the world, people do not want financial guarantees anymore. Uh, do, it, can't we say that traditional life, when it's financial guarantees, that, that life is basically debt? That uh, what the life industry needs to do is to find alternatives. I mean, we're coming back to long-term care and healthcare and so on. Uh, is that the sort of thing that you're thinking of when you're saying guarantees, that it does not necessarily have to be a financial guarantee? Well, I think that ideally there should be financial guarantees. I think that if you give a good rate for somebody, they will jump on it, and I don't think the guarantees will be dead. But the problem is if you're today in Germany, the interest rates are negative, no? So you're yeah. giving an interest, a native interest, I'm sure that there won't be that big of a That's push, a technical <laughs> problem, I can tell you. You don't need but, to be an actuary for that. But what, <laughs> what is happening is that everybody wants to jump now into VUL, into variable unit link products, where the stockholder doesn't have to put capital, or the capital is minimum, yeah. and the risk is transferred to the policyholder. That makes it so much easier. The problem is that, that it's a more complicated product to sell. You need better trained agents or, or channels that are well prepared to present properly and that they are uh, presenting the right rates and they're not prom promising 15% returns on variable unit-linked products. And so 
there, there has to be options. The policyholder needs to have options. And if they want a VUL product, that's fine. We need to sell it properly. And if they want a guarantee, that's fine. We should be able to provide, to generate this, the guarantees for them too. So I, I think it's our job as an industry to present the options that the policyholder needs. And as, as an industry, be it regulators, uh, uh, companies, or associations, we need to figure out how to do it the right way without putting at risk the savings of the policyholder in the, in the future or putting at risk the insurance company. And, and what I'm, I'm pleading is that we need to figure out how to do that. Today, we're, the, the pendulum went from being all the way to the left and now it's all the way to the right and we're, 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 we need to figure out a middle ground where this continues to be an option. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I'll come back to you, Yoshi, in a minute, uh, but I wanted to... Is on that issue? Yeah, yes, go ahead. To, you know, uh, of course, maybe I understand your point, but as a Japanese living in, you know, low interest rate uh, for a long period of, course, of yes. time, I just tell you, you know, what happened in early 90s in Japan. Uh, anyway, Japan is a kind of, you know, unique market where around 20 big companies at that time operated in the life side, and out of which five went bust. And only because they sold, at that time, six or seven percent guaranteed, you know, long-term guaranteed 20, 30 years. And at that time, you know, economy was booming, uh, late 80s, and the industry was very, very, you know, how they say, uh, optimistic, and the regulators and so on did not step in. So, of course, you know, those guarantee product is important from the consumer's point of view, but bottom line, insurance cap company have to be sustainable and the product should be cautious enough, you know, so that's why balance is important and of course, you know, you could argue that the regulators moved too far away, but I still want to emphasize that, you know, caution and that's also related to long term sort of, you know, infrastructure investment is the same. Of course, we need those long term investment naturally for the growth, but again, caution, you know, with a limited amount of data, and naturally those are politically exposed product and investment. So sometimes, you know, because of growth, because of policyholders' needs, you know, our, our discussion is too far away. And the bottom line from the regulator's point of view, I hope that you really agree on, yes, we have to protect policyholders and we have to protect any companies not go bust, you know. So that's, uh, that's a kind of issue that we want to stress very much from the regulatory perspective. Very good. I, I wouldn't expect anything else from you, Yoshi, to <laughs> remind <laughs> people <laughs> that they have to drive on the right side of the road. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted to ask you a question about, because I liked you, your, your message, we have to solve the problem. We don't have to develop a problem just for, to have a product, but to solve the problem. How do you look at the insurance industry today? Uh, do you think that the insurance industry is selling the right products that are solving the problems? Well, you know, I, I'm in the industry, so I should defend the industry. <laughs> we, we won't no. tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I come from uh, the part of the insurance industry which uh, for a long, long time already was a little bit different. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the life and the whole discussion, which is, I think, the very important discussion here in the long term and so on. But I think there is, a, if you take the whole PNC uh, insurance, which is still very relevant uh, for everything which we have in, in our life, um, and when we come to the point of view of the customer in this, in this part of the insurance, uh, I think we are not doing still the right things. Where I come from, I come from, Sergio alluded to, it's the assistance which is insurance, but insurance in kind, which means that when something happens to you, I'm not paying you a check, I'm not sending you a money transfer. At the moment you have a problem and you step in contact with me, I have to say what I can f do for you. So if it's the car accident, I send you someone and I help you. If you are in a, I don't know, foreign country and you have a health problem, I take care because I have an access to this healthcare provider and so on. So it means that every time I try to take, and you know, it's the best word to give you a peace of mind, because you are in a stressful situation. So you paid a premium to cover this, but still it's not enough when you call me and I tell you, in two weeks' time you will have your check. You still have your problem. And I think 
you were talking about the very low NPS in the insurance industry, and it's true. When we look at the NPS of the companies which are using what I call services, which are, which are kind of solving the problem, the NPS is very high. And uh, in assistance company, which I represent in Allianz World, our NPS goes to 68 when you talk about you know, NPS in insurance industry, which might be even negative sometimes. <laughs> now it's much better, but at the beginning of the story. So I think we have to have this, I would say, shift as well. And we have to think as insurers how much we can, first of all, solve, provide the service, because the world change on any time, anywhere. Because of the technology, because of internet, we might still be in the ancient world, but you know, the generation after us, our children, they don't care in a week time, it's now. And I think it's the proper way. So uh, I think that first of all, we are not yet there, we are on the way, it's again a journey. I think the, the, all the big insurance groups are talking about it. Today we've heard from two big insurers on the panel when I was um, on technology. Uh, anything which is around connected home, connected car, uh, connected health, it's all about actually answering to these needs through a service, and then at the end there is an insurance protection. I'm not saying we have to hide away from that, but the conversation with the customer is totally different, his satisfaction is totally different, and I think we start to be more relevant to them in the moment where they expect from us something. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about that one, but I think it's the way to go and it's not solving all the problems, of course, lo longevity and, uh, for example, this topic we looked through as well, can we engage ourselves with, uh, with kind of a long-term service, for example, there are some economical issues behind that, uh, because you have to be sure that you will be able in 10 years' time provide the same level and quality of service with actuarial views of how much it will cost. I was going to ask you, <laughs> <laughs> have you talked course, to the actuaries? Yeah. Of course, of course. So, so, but that's our job, and I, I do agree, we have to figure out. We have to figure out, because I think that's the way to go. There is one point also I wanted to make that we have to take into uh, account, because of the change, is the whole shared economy. I think the way the risks are built in the shared economy are very different. And again, it's all about the peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, about servicing, building trust. And we as insurers, we can also step in with the same, I would say, again, philosophy. Think about what kind of problem you have to solve. In shared economy, when people are not owning any more cars, but they are just renting cars when they go for a weekend and then they take a car for a holiday and so on, and they do the blah blah car, which we've heard this, um, this, uh, this uh, lunchtime. What they want is that something happens, you have insurance to cover this specific event, right? You took uh, the household insurance. When you start to work with Airbnb, sometimes you are a private person insured for your household. Sometimes you become a commercial element because you are actually renting your house to somebody. There is a blur. How we insurers are providing an answer to this kind of a person who is sometimes a personal cover and sometimes almost a commercial type of a cover. I think that's the, I would say, very fascinating part of where we go and there are answers. Excellent. I, I love that. I think that's indeed a very important move where insurance moves more to a service-oriented business, which I think is very important. Yoshi, from a regulatory point of view, if you listen to that, uh, don't, you, don't you fear that we will run then into some problems of uh, intrusive sort of uh, collection of data and how to handle those data and the risk that somebody might steal those data, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cybersecurity and so on. Yeah. How, how will regulators, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, definitely data protection is a key for whole discussion of this, you know, fintech and cyber issues. But before touching on that issue, just to just reply to, to your question to Ida, uh, not as a regulator, but it's a little bit, you know, personal view. But uh, this, uh, you know, fintech or data, huge amount of data, speed, accumulation, and also network, you know, just this, uh, this morning, I, we had a very interesting presentation that uh, through internet, we could create, create community, 
community of uh, policyholders wh which know each other or which create some sort of, you know, like community in an old village, let's say. And people understand each other and people naturally avoid any fraudulent, you know, issues or behavior, try to prevent risk and so on and help each other. And if we could reach that kind of, you know, good use of technology to create community type of insurance, like in a sense, you know, very traditional mutual or cooperative type of, you know, uh, over the internet, that could create, first of all, loss ratio is going down, and also it's easy access to insurance. And that's, that's a very positive, you know, effect. And current insurance product, commercial insurance product, is more sort of, you know, buy and sell and get, pro, uh, you know, protection, but more sort of, you know, real network type of, you know, potential is exists in the, this online world. So I think this, there is an industry's effort and opportunity to create something new and also provide good product in a more reasonable price through, through this uh, internet community. But as you said, protection of the data is extremely important. And the, last week, you know, we had similar discussion and uh, cyber issue is now global and cyber crime is global. And you might heard this, uh, many people heard this, you know, Bangladesh Central Bank lo almost lost one billion data for this international transaction because of the cyber uh, criminal. And this incident signals that not only one single country, but also other countries have to work class closely, exchange of information between, of course, insurance regulators, but also other financial authorities, including central bank. And this kind of very co tight cooperation, including confidential exchange of information, and also timely exchange of information and communication is critical to, to you know, ensure this very optimistic and also very pro prosperous, you know, internet world will be established. Okay, Julie, uh, you, you, you mentioned that there is a lot of interest in long-term care in the U.S., that there are developments there. I thought that you were more advanced in Europe in that area. So what are the, the challenges that you see? How can you promote this product service uh, uh, more for, for, for in, a, in a U.S. Uh, environment? Well, we have uh, determined that promoting the provision of long-term care insurance and the actual uptake by consumers is more of a societal problem, actually, not just an insurance problem. Certainly, we have had products that have been available for some time, and, and some cu customers have availed themselves of the product. There's not been uh, the best price stability in the products that have been in the marketplace. And so we see a lot of customers not interested in taking up long-term care insurance. And, and we blame some of the, the pricing instability as well as the product features for that. But going forward and looking uh, toward an innovative and creative solution, we think we are going to have to partner with other um, interested stakeholders, mostly uh, state governments and the federal government, because when uh, people do not purchase long-term Term care insurance but need that end of life care, it can be quite costly and we can run into a situation where uh, customers have to spend down their assets, qualify for public assistance and then it becomes a uh, state Medicaid budget issue to care for these consumers through the end of their life through this assisted uh, care living arrangement. And so really we have uh, federal congressional interest in the issue. We have state budget um, interest in the issue. And certainly, uh, state regulators and customer interest in how to solve this problem of providing care for individuals as they age, which could be in the home, it could be in a nursing facility, or it could be something in the middle. It could be some kind of um, cognitive issue that needs a partial assistance with daily living, but not so much medical treatment. But the cost to our society is growing at such a rate that for the first time, regulators are in a position of saying it's for the greater good that we create a solution to this problem. We, it's very difficult for us to step out and say, you need to purchase a long-term care insurance policy as a regulator, because that's a very uncomfortable feeling to say it's sort of your, uh, your public duty to provide for your own long-term care. But um, we do recognize that the system that we have right now is not working. Those, those blocks of business that have been out don't have any stability in terms of pricing. And so we, we have a situation where customers 
customers have paid for a product. They have seen the rates increase at substantial rates because of the high cost of claims and the high incidence of claims that the block of business has experienced. And we realize that we're going to have to come up with a new product that can be appropriately priced, probably with some unique features like the wraparounds that we discussed a little bit er earlier, either a, a whole life product or maybe a health product so that it can be a complementary uh, provision in addition to another insurance product. And the only way to really make it attractive to consumers. But uh, it is something that we are going to have to solve in the, in the very near future. But we do have a lot of stakeholders aligned with us trying to solve the problem. We do have a, a new subgroup started at the NEIC level that is uh, really engaging with other stakeholders in terms of Congress and state budget directors and, and the industry and consumer representatives to help us determine what kind of product might be attractive to consumers, something that insurers would want to write and that could be priced appropriately to take some of the pressure off the federal and state budgets. Uh, my, uh, yes, Mario, um, is that a development that you can also see happening in, in, in Mexico, that people are looking for, instead of life, for something else, more <laughs> something material? Uh, yeah, I, think, I think that, well, first of all, um, Mexico is a very young country. Mexico is uh, the average age in Mexico is 26. Uh, we're so not you're, not, you're not a life problem. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. But um, the long-term care is something that is, is going to be needed and is starting to get developed. Um, reverse mortgages are going to be something that is going to be needed down the road, and we're trying to prepare the market for both of them. Um, accidents and health, uh, we have uh, public uh, a health system that um, is available for anybody that works in Mexico, and, uh, but it's the, the availability is not as good because it's, it's basically saturated, and so there's a need for private insurance on the health side, and, and that is uh, a large part of the Mexican market. Uh, we're a, a country that usually gets hurricanes uh, from both sides, from the Atlantic and the Pacific, so uh, and earthquakes. So PNC is uh, is is also needed. So it's it's a it's a country that is going to be growing at a very rapid pace because when you're young, you have nothing to insure. But as the population starts to age, it's going to be a country that is going to be booming. Um, and I think that the growth rates in the next uh, 10 years are going to be double digit every year. So it's, it's uh, an up and coming country in, in insurance wise. Very good. Gordon, uh, when you were mentioning uh, the way you, you, you approach the customers, I was just wondering who sells those products uh, in Hong Kong? Do you, you know, it's, it's not click, click, click. It's probably who are you? Uh, you know, it's, it's physical persons that are selling these products. The vast majority of the business in Asia is face-to-face. -face. I mean, you have direct marketing in, you know, maybe Korea, Japan, North Asia, but it really doesn't happen in, in most of Asia. So the biggest challenge we have, without question, is distribution reach. And the biggest challenge within that is, is balance. Someone mentioned this morning how to get the quantity up with, re, with having the quality. So it's very easy to go and get you know, 500,000 agents, but they need to be trained. Um, so that's something that we have really, really focused on and we've built kind of, uh, we call them premier academies in each of our countries, so that we give about 30 days training in the first year, which is quite unusual for an insurance company. Um, so we didn't know, how do we really get that quality? We needed a benchmark. You know, you can guess I like to measure things. So we used uh, the US uh, MDRT, which is kind of a corny name, to be honest, MDRT. But it, it's, a, it's a very good benchmark because it really reflects on the quality of the business that's sold. So we have heavily promoted that with our agency forces all over China, Hong Kong, Singapore, whatever. And we you know, have very strong a very high percentage of our agency force are MDRT qualified or COT or TOT. So that's something that, that we really believe in. It's very easy to, to just increase the number of agents. So we need to have them trained and finding those people is difficult. But I think life insurance and health insurance has changed. It used to be very difficult to get people to join this business. Um, I think particularly in Hong Kong that has changed. 
people um, come into our academies, and we have some real superstars um, who, who are amazing people, and they really relate with, you know, Gen Y. Um, I mean, one of our top agents, for example, he comes on and he talks about, he, he, has, he has built five schools in China from his commission. And when he's up on stage talking to these young guys who are like 24, 25 years of age, they want to be like him. And he's not, he's not in a cubicle all day from 7 in the morning to 11 at night. He or she is out there, um, you know, and they're communicating. And it's a, it's, you know, someone also said earlier, you know, it's a fantastic industry to be in because you really can create so much. I mean, insurance is the original kind of shared value type of, type of concept, the taunting. So I really believe that we have to train them. Of course, we look for new distribution, you know, enabling through digital, et cetera. We have deals with banks. Um, but most, the vast majority of the business sold today is, is through face-to-face, -face, um, whether it's IFA or agency, tied agency distribution. Is it likely going to be like that? Because I would always believe that in Asia, yeah. people are very sensitive to these IT developments and... Well, I... I, I uh, I think one thing that I mentioned earlier is uh, the need for private insurance is really there because there's no social security net. And the regulators we have in the region, you know, we're very much aligned. They want people to buy insurance. They want to fill that protection gap. So, you know, we're very, very much aligned. So I do believe that face-to-face -face will be there. It will be very different shape of form and how we enable things through social media and how we create more qualified leads, et cetera, et cetera. But yet, to answer your question, I, I think very much so, because it's very different from, you know, say the UK, where there's still a massive protection gap, but you don't have face-to-face -face people there. There's a social security safety net, and most of the IFAs ha end up actually just doing high net worth and not really serving the middle market, and that's something in Asia that we don't want to replicate. Okay, Yoshi? Yeah, just to, yes, what... Um to Gordon mentions, but I just think just uh, this is not black and white issue. So, uh, you know, um, as uh, morning session, Turbion uh, explained what's going, on in, what's going on in the normal customs, the customers these days. So, of course, a uh, critical moment, they want to have a dialogue with the, with the insurance expert. But often the case, they click and they get the information through online. So they get some general information beforehand. And even after talking with the expert of the company, they click again to narrow down their scope. And then they, they decide. So it's not black and white that the online uh, is replacing to, to you know, this face-to-face uh, -face, uh, buying and uh, selling stuff. But uh, more this online world will help getting correct information. And particularly youngsters, you know, they have a completely different mentality. And also there is an area that we can learn from, particular industry can learn from emerging markets. Like we do some exercise with emerging market and they have a huge penetration or potential penetration with the online used mobile insurance. And they are really starting. And it have to be very simple product. You know, life product is a very simple, clear product. So there is an opportunity and also a chance that I'm, I'm pretty sure that the industry can explore uh, through this online and have a more, uh, you know, to provide good information so that the potential clients can make a good decision. I might ask you a question which uh, was raised this morning in the panel about fintech. And Julia, I'm also going to ask you the questions regularly, as you see. Uh, do you believe that these developments should take place within the framework of the established rules and regulations so as to avoid the Ubers and whatever other uh, inventions that might come? Uh, how do you look at that? Do you want to begin? <laughs> you can uh, fight it out. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do think that... Um, the current framework that we have is uh, what some of the providers are really focused at, uh, with through offering products today. But do we need to revise some of those rules and regulations? I think probably so. Uh, what Yoshi mentioned in emerging markets is also our experience in the United States. If there's an app on your phone that can allow you to secure insurance just as it can uh, cause you to secure a taxi or a, a ride share through Uber, that's where we see our gen 
Y and younger consumers going. Uh, they would rather use an app on their phone than even you know, a desktop computer or other online clicking to get the information. And so we have to be cognizant to not stifle that marketplace for the insurers that want to offer products to those customers. And I think that you know, those are niche customers. They have different needs. As um, another panelist mentioned, it may not be to insure a car uh, 365 days a year. It might be a car share arrangement, or it might be um, a, an intermittent car. Uh, that, and that's a very different world from our uh, property and casualty insurers that like to, buy, to sell three, six, or 12-month policies that cover the car and all the drivers for that car. It's a very different world. So I think we do have to be cognizant of not allowing antiquated rules and regulations to stifle that marketplace because we know that's where consumers and some insurers want to go. Excellent. Uh, yeah, Yoshi? I totally agree. So just to, uh, there are three types of uh, regulatory issues here. Uh, one is uh, insurance, current insurance regulation totally works in the, you know, or the, the uh, digital world, like, you know, insurance provided by huge wide network of website, um, but there, and in case they have a huge uh, mis-setting, current you know, insurance regulation can naturally intervene immediately. So that's one kind. And second kind is in that case, if, I don't know, that's a sort of some, some high-tech company have a huge access to, to consumers, not insurance company, and those companies like mobile companies or whatever, they participate in product design or they create the product. So this is a gray zone. In that case, this mobile or you know, telecom company, we consider, we might have to consider we have to have a license or some regulation on that company. So that's a second area that we should consider. So that's a kind of still we can live in current framework of insurance. The third area is like uh, peer and peer type of, you know, that we discussed this morning and this afternoon too, that's a completely different setup. There is a no insurance company and the peer and the peer just agree on an investor step in and there is no specific insurance entity. That's the most challenging part of regulation. There is no specific entity that we can step in or current traditional sense of entity. So those areas we have to explore carefully and how, what we structure regulation and supervision in that area. This is a totally new, I understand, approach. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are uh, moving ahead in time, and now it is time for you to ask questions. Again, if you could state your name uh, and um, address your question to a member of the panel. Can I see? There is a question over here in the first row. Can we have the mic over here? It's uh, Callum Tanner at risk.net. I wanted to ask about products um, the, the IAS consider systemic, such as variable annuities, whether regulation could be a barrier to certain products, and uh, specifically if you have any products in mind that could be systemic, and um, what barriers there are to those in development. Yoshi, I think that is a question for you, apparently. <laughs> I thought that today I don't have to discuss about systemic, <laughs> systemic risk issues. So, uh, as you know, just for, for, for you, you, you follow maybe closely, but just background, we just uh, uh, issue consultation paper and we finalize this systemic risk analysis soon. And so you will expect our final conclusion soon on your table, let's say within a few weeks, hopefully. So our thought is uh, current, you know, um, the part specifically NTNI, so-called NTNI part, we did debate internally and we almost reached conclusion. So within that context, I describe where we are now. So of course, you know, uh, we have two uh, channel, uh, transmission channel of, of systemic risk in terms of related to product. One is um, uh, naturally we call it the asset liquidity channel. That means fire sales, in, in case of crisis, fire sales could occur, and so on. And the other channel that we uh, very much uh, consider systemic concern is so-called exposure, which means that you know, uh, there's a huge uh, interconnection, so uh, there is a, uh, exposure from the insurance industry to other financial sector, so there is a link. 
and that could create some interconnectedness and so on. And specifically product, you know, uh, particularly um, variable annuity type of, of product which have a guarantee and also a choice of the policy holder and which cannot be covered by contract basis. So contra contract basis existing product. So that's that we uh, very much uh, look at carefully and we just, uh, as you, you might have seen our last consultation paper, we, we see that th there is a risk, potential systemic concern because of the liquidity concern and also um, it, it could create some interconnectedness uh, of other uh, part of the financial system. So this is what we have discussed uh, so far, but at the same time, we know very well that this is a part of the whole story of systemic concern. Um, as uh, Dirk or somebody mentioned this afternoon, that the product-focused approach is not all for systemic concern. For example, low interest rate environment continuously continue. It could be a market-wide systemic concern. So not entity issue, but more market issue in the industries itself. So those issues, and the IMF report this issue recently, and we watch carefully. And we, we might consider you know, the other approach in addition to product design. But uh, this is not yet concluded uh, within ourselves. So bottom line is we, we work hard, carefully, but we currently focus on product approach and variable annuities type of, with guarantees, a kind of issue that we carefully watch. But we also think about other part of systemic you know, transmission issues in the long term. Thank you very much, Josie. But clearly, the IAS is not going to forbid these type of products. Of course not. No, just to, but to be careful. Again, you know, Marius, you know, comment and so on. Be careful. Then we have to take that issue very carefully, and regulators have yeah. to watch carefully. Okay. Too. Thank you. Any other question? I don't see any any hands. Uh, uh, <coughs> well, it so happens that. Uh, we still have a, a few minutes to go, and maybe uh, I'm going to ask each member of the panel a very simple question. <laughs> you have now 650 people in front of you, and I'm asking you, what message would you pass to the audience in terms of product innovation, the customer of the future? What for you is the most important thing that should happen to make product innovation possible and leading to a positive outcome? What is the most important thing that should happen? Ira, you can start with <laughs> for, for me, the most important thing which should happen is that we as industry, so insurers, we have to really, really listen to the customer needs. So we say that, I think we are better and better, but we're still a little bit product driven and not customer driven. And I think as quickly as we can change this attitude, this will bring the innovation. Yeah, just to building on Ida's comment, uh, industry has a huge, huge potential opportunities of business. And just to following either your, your first comment at the beginning, it's a huge opportunity to provide not only product, but solution. Solution before selling product, after selling product, once accident happens, this digital community have a huge opportunity. You provide not only one single product, but the whole range of solution from the beginning to the end. So that's, uh, I think, and of course, regulators watch carefully how it works, but it's a huge opportunity for the industry. Three. I think my message would be to really focus on the unmet need that we have talked about today. So a retirement security, long-term care, you know, even cybersecurity, and engage with your stakeholders, with your regulators, both domestically and internationally, to try to solve for those unmet needs. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about, um, a customer for a cybersecurity policy might be other businesses throughout the world. I mean, Home Depot, Target, I'm sure that they wish that they 
had a cybersecurity policy that covered all of their bases. And so be thinking of ways to assist all customers to manage and mitigate their risks, whether it's on their own uh, retirement longevity or on cybersecurity breaches in the future. Okay, Mario. Balance. Balance between the customer need and the financial strength. You cannot, as an insurance company, you cannot survive on sales. They have to be profitable sales. They have to be long-term sales. You have to, put, to be able to retain the policyholder. This is, has to be a multi-transaction policyholder, not just one product once in a lifetime. We need to be there for all their needs. And so there has to be that balance between knowing what they need and being able to provide that with uh, financial strength. Okay, Gordon? Um, I think we need to look through the lens of the customer, okay? You know, I agree with you that it's what the customer wants, but what the customer needs. But what we don't seem to do is we don't seem to do that properly. We need a process to listen and work out what's important and what's not important. So even something as simple as a net promoter score, you know, people just look at the result. But if you, if you look at, if you do it properly, you get so much information that's amazing, you know, of everything you're really bad at and everything that's really important. You might be really bad at things that are not important and no one ever talks about them. So I think our anchor is we, we want to be easy to do business with. Um, so I, I think if you can really listen and understand what is critical um, for the customer and, you know, as Mario said, you know, balance in terms of... Uh, you know, the, the needs and the wants, but you really need to understand the customer first. You need to see through the customer's lens. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is good news. I'm very pleased that our last panel today could end up a note of good news. What is the good news? There are many opportunities to deal with the customer of the future's wishes and desires. If we listen to the customer, we examine what these problems are, try to solve them, and make sure that the regulation is not such that it makes it possible to evolve in our thinking also about how to deal with these new innovative insurance products. Well, on that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to thank with me the members of the panel for, I think, an excellent contribution. <laughs>